Well, thank you very much, James. Uh, it's a privilege to be here at uh, uh, Heartland Institute's Climate Reality Forum, perhaps the only sane place in, in Glasgow right now. This is an extraordinary spectacle. Uh, what we're seeing is tens of thousands of people gathering, coming in their private jets and their chauffeur-driven cars. I was speaking to the taxi driver on the way here, and he was saying that uh, they were actually not doing much business here at all, quite unlike what you would expect, because all of these delegates were being chauffeured around in their own chauffeur-driven cars. So I think that tells you everything you need to know about what kind of event this is. This is an event uh, where people think that the rules don't apply for them. They tell us that our emissions, we have to get them down. It's the most important thing that we can do. And yet, for their special event, uh, their jamboree, that they have to have every year, um, they have to come here in person. They couldn't do it on Zoom. So that's the context we're in. We're in a context of quite extraordinary exaggeration uh, and an international political uh, group think um, that has enveloped world leaders' uh, mindsets and, and there isn't much challenge to in the international political arena at the moment. So I'm Harry Wilkinson. I'm Head of Policy at the Global Warming uh, Policy Foundation and also our campaigning sister organization, uh, Net Zero Watch. Uh, and I'm here to tell you a bit more about the British political context to this. Yes, there are many international issues uh, here at play, um, but actually this specific COP26 conference, actually there's some important domestic narratives um, going on here as well, which I think feed in to the international political landscape, but also are quite important contextually to this specific conference uh, that we're having right now. Now, the British uh, political uh, landscape was uh, quite dominated uh, by the European Union referendum for quite some time. Um, and that <laughs> negotiation process uh, with the European Union took a long time to resolve itself and really dominated the British political landscape for a number of years. Um, and a key architect of that uh, was Boris Johnson, the now Prime Minister, and his sidekick, uh, Dominic Cummings, who played a big role in that campaign. Now, Dominic Cummings was the key advisor to Boris Johnson, uh, who delivered him his 2019 election victory. Um, but what we've seen recently is the demise of Dominic Cummings. He was sacked from his crucial government role. Um, and it now seems that his key uh, courtesan has become uh, his now wife, uh, Carrie Simmons. And the whole dynamic of the government uh, has changed. And so we've seen a change of focus uh, in the build-up to this conference from uh, the government's onto climate change, and this is being really the main uh, pillar of UK government policy making uh, right now. And uh, Carrie Simmons, who's clearly played a significant role in this, is, is sitting within a milieu of uh, friends and advisors, including uh, Zach Goldsmith, a, a, an essentially a failed uh, politician who lost his seat uh, in Richmond. Um, but has now uh, failed upwards to the House of Lords. Um, and uh, his brother as well, Ben Goldsmith, um, who's influential within the Conservative Environment Network, which has become quite uh, involved in this, and uh, the who are funded actually by the European Climate Foundation. So there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of vested interests here. Uh, and we're seeing a real shift uh, to climate policy. Now, Boris has always been quite malleable. He's always sort of tried to seize the moment um, and likes to see himself as a big political statement, a big political statesman who seizes the moment. And so he has chosen this climate conference to be his moment 
where he shapes the international political arena. Now, he really wants this to be a success, and so he's using the most exaggerated language to try and achieve that. He's, he said it's one minute to midnight. Now, that language just um, a few years ago would have seemed extraordinary, and he would have pointed to the extraordinary progress of the Industrial Revolution as having changed people's uh, lives for the better. Uh, and so for him now to be speaking um, about it being one minute to midnight and so ignorantly of the actual wider developmental progress that we've seen um, over the past century since the Industrial Revolution is quite a striking uh, change. But it all sits within a context of sort of increasing hysteria in the media and amongst our political class uh, here in the UK. Britain is, of course, the birthplace of Extinction Rebellion, um, who have actually become a worldwide alarmist political movement um, around the issue of climate change and have become really important players in this debate. And even though through their protests, they're actually putting, a lot, putting off a lot of members of the public. Their most recent instantiation has been a group called Insulate Britain, who have sat in roads, blocking highways, um, and actually stopping hospitals, reaching hos uh, to getting patients to hospitals, and causing all sorts of misery. Now, that's been unpopular, but what it has achieved is an increasing uh, hysteria um, that is rarely unchallenged. For example, one of the key founding members of Extinction Rebellion was a guy called Roger Hallam. Uh, now, he went on an interview on our main public broadcaster, the BBC, um, and he claimed that billions of people uh, were at risk from dying uh, from climate change. Now, that's not, as we know, um, a statement that's supported by the science on climate change. It's a million miles away from what the scientists are actually saying. However, that went completely unchallenged on the BBC. And that's really reflective of a media landscape in the UK in which alarmist claims about climate change aren't actually challenged. Um, and that's really sad. It's uh, very narrowing. And we look to uh, the US where, albeit there is a polarized debate about this topic, you at least hear both sides of the argument. Um, and while it's the Democrats and Joe Biden who are now in control in the White House, um, the great work of organizations like Heartland and CFACT have really sort of entrenched climate change realism and a rational response to climate change within the Republican Party in the States. And so we're very uh, pleased to see that, um, but it also reminds us of what a challenging landscape uh, that we have in the UK, uh, where uh, the political and media establishments are so united around uh, climate change policies um, that will cause so much damage uh, to our economy uh, here in the UK. Now, a key instrument that was used to put legislative meat on the bones of the climate change agenda was the Climate Change Act. Now, this goes further than a lot of many other countries um, because it actually sets binding targets um, in UK law that uh, the government has to try and achieve. And it, th that overall target, which has now been upgraded from an original target of an 80% reduction uh, in CO2 emissions by 2050 to a 100% reduction or net zero. Um, and so that's now part of the institutional landscape uh, within the UK. And what that piece of legislation also did was to establish the Climate Change Committee, originally called the Committee on Climate Change. 
Um, and this was an organization that UK ministers who had been democratically elected, nevertheless, were forced to seek the advice of the Climate Change Committee, uh, which became a nexus for uh, green industrial groups to promote their interests and to ensure that they were represented uh, to UK uh, legislators. And the Mail on Sunday, through an excellent reporter called David Rose, has actually shone a, a light on some of the conflicts of interest there. For example, the chairman of that organization, Lord Deben, has received hundreds of thousands of pounds from conflicted businesses who were involved in producing renewable energy um, through his family-run sustainability consultancy, Sandcroft. So this was an organization that was supposed to be providing independent advice to government, but had nonetheless been taken over by vested interests. Um, and the once those interests had been exposed, uh, the UK establishment didn't want to know about it. And, and that story was sort of conveniently uh, looked over. And Lord Deben is, of course, uh, still the chairman of the Committee on Climate Change and is here uh, in Glasgow at, at the climate uh, conference. And, uh, of course, the UK government has continued its crusade to promote net zero. And although it's not the policy that we would recommend, it's certainly one that you have to acknowledge the UK government has had some success in promoting other countries uh, to adopt this extraordinarily expensive target. Um, <laughs> and we've seen in the build-up to COP, many countries also adopt a net zero target. Now, work that we've done at the Global Warming Policy Foundation is suggesting that this could cost the UK in excess of three trillion pounds. So in the US, where the economy is over 10 times larger, you're looking at sort of probably over 35 uh, trillion dollars, almost sort of uh, unbelievable amounts of money to achieve uh, fractional changes uh, in the Earth's uh, temperature. And uh, Britain has been very keen to sort of describe itself as a world leader in climate change in pushing this net zero agenda. But what happens if we actually look at the UK's uh, environmental performance? Now, a really important thing to do is to actually compare uh, territorial emissions, that's the emissions that take place here in Britain, um, that's used for conventional uh, carbon accounting, and you will see that Britain has done fantastically well, reduced its emissions by sort of over 40% since 1990. And ministers are very happy to congratulate themselves on this so-called achievement, uh, which they say has happened while the UK economy has also been growing. Um, however, that's only part of the story. The other important part of the story, of course, is that actually what's happening over that last 30 years is that UK industry has closed and we're importing more and more products from countries like China, countries like India, who have been developing and have been industrializing through fossil fuels. Um, and if you look at consumption-based emissions, which incorporates our wider carbon footprint, you'll see that actually it's, uh, it's only fallen very modestly. Um, because that carbon footprint relies on us just importing um, products from elsewhere. So this movement has been growing and growing, and uh, it, it hasn't been challenged. But what we're seeing now is an increasing challenge to that. And so that's quite encouraging. Um, we're seeing in the media, people are beginning to stand up um, and question elements of this agenda. It's never been so large before. And in the build up to COP, the actual relentless focus on this topic has actually drawn many people into questioning some of the elements of the program. And uh, we've also, 
in the last few months, we've seen extraordinary rises in energy prices, particularly in the gas price and electricity prices. And, and your viewers in America might be surprised to learn that we're actually paying six times more for natural gas in the UK than you pay in the US. So there is this staggering difference in energy prices, and, and those are largely politically driven. So look at the UK's example as what not to do. The costs for American taxpayers and residents if they adopt British type restrictions on fossil fuel activities, we've banned fracking, we won't allow uh, the exploitation of all these, uh, all this natural gas reserves that we have underneath our feet. Uh, we take this high and mighty attitude that we're apparently too good to exploit these resources. And so ordinary British people are paying the, the, the price for that through, through higher uh, energy costs. But these are beginning to bite. People are now really feeling the cost of these policies. Uh, and so we've seen a number of developments. And I think one, one of those has been uh, the emergence of the net zero scrutiny group of MPs. This is a group of MPs within the Conservative Party of over 40 MPs uh, who are determined to question, to scrutinize, to examine uh, climate change legislation as it passes through the British Parliament. Uh, and we haven't seen this before, this organized opposition essentially to net zero. Um, and that organized process um, which is being led by Craig McKinley, MP, who's the chairman of that committee, and S Steve Baker, who's chairman of the steering group of the Net Zero Scrutiny Group, who are beginning to wield influence, and they're picking up more media attention in The Telegraph and on GB News and talk radio um, in terms of providing an opposition to those policies. So we might start to see the landscape change in, in a positive way, um, and uh, certainly the media landscape is also changing. Um, it's been a big political story in the UK over the last year has been the emergence of GB News. Um, because for many years in the UK, we had uh, just one um, establishment narrative that was being set by the likes of the BBC and Sky News and ITV. Um, who weren't actually allowing anyone to debate these topics. And the BBC actually have a document uh, which describes how they can't allow so-called climate skeptics to even have a say because they say that creates false balance. But on what topic um, is actually the quality of the conversation reduced by people asking questions? Um, so this is a, is a pernicious uh, way of looking at the world so that actually certain that people need to be protected from uh, uncomfortable uh, voices, uncomfortable perspectives. Um, and so the BBC has this patrician attitude, I think, um, in terms of saying we know best. If people ask questions, it's dangerous. And I'm sure you'll be familiar uh, in the States, we've seen the big tech companies um, increasingly censor what people can say. Uh, we've seen a large number of Twitter accounts flagged and potentially removed. Even your former president, Donald Trump, was taken off Twitter. And that political um, intolerance is very much present here in the UK and has been imposing on that agenda. So what GB News has been, has been a completely different way of doing things. Um, their objective has not been to present a particular political uh, narrative, but it's been to actually have different voices on certain topics and improving the breadth and the quality of debate by changing uh, that narrowness, expanding the conversation so that we can actually debate and get to the crux of these important issues. Um, so that's very encouraging. We've also 
recently launched Net Zero Watch, which is, as I say, the campaigning sister organization of the Global Warming Policy uh, Foundation, formerly known as the Global Warming Policy Forum, to really focus on these policies, because actually that academic conversation around climate change is all very well, but it only means something for people if when once it has been translated into policies that affect people's lives. Uh, climate change and catastrophic climate change, the climate crisis, these would be harmless ideas if they were just ideas, if they were just things that were debated in academia. But of course they're not. These are ideas that actually threaten our very way of life and aim to cast human progress, the enlightenment and the industrial revolution as toxic elements, when actually these were the processes that raised us up to the living standards that we have now, to the world we have today where you're 99% less likely to die in an in extreme weather event. So these uh, alarmist views are very worrying. In Britain, we've had increasing secularization. I think part of the attraction of uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, here in Britain and around Europe has been we have become much more secular as a society and so there is this appeal to actually a belief system which is based off of uh, a, a sort of salvationist movement which aims to save the world by simply reducing our emissions and it's a simple uh, narrative that I think actually gains a lot from that simplicity. That idea of a, the apocalypse has actually a, carries a lot of weight. Um, and if people can be saved from that, uh, then you can see exactly why the Extinction Rebellion movement has been so successful. So I'll leave it there and uh, hope to get to people's uh, comments. Yes, Harry, you will get comments. I needed you to go for another 15 seconds is all, so I can get back here. <laughs> we'll roll with it. Um, Harry, you'll be happy to know that uh, there's been a ton of engagement in the chat room, uh, Great. in the chat next to the, uh, the feed on YouTube uh, during your presentation, so uh, during your, your remarks. Yeah, well, so thank you for that. I'm very interested to hear what people are saying. Well, there was one that I noticed actually from mm. before you started. Um, I forget who put this in the chat, but I'll just read it out. There are calls for a referendum on net zero 2050 in the UK, taking lessons from Brexit, which mm. went a pretty good way if you, want, yeah, if you wanted yeah, yeah. that, um, and certainly surprised a lot of people. Isn't that the right way to go now? I mean, if, if net zero 2050 was put to a referendum, how do you think that would turn out? Or, and do you think that's a good idea? I think this referendum idea has picked up so much traction just in the last couple of weeks, there's been a number of stories in the Telegraph. There's been a poll uh, by YouGov, a prominent pollster, which asked people um, whether they thought the referendum on net zero was a good idea. And actually, once you exclude don't knows from that, you found that almost 60% of people wanted a referendum on net zero. And I think this idea carries such weight because it's a topic where people haven't been asked for their opinions on. Uh, no one has been asked, do you want an uh, air source heat pump? This is a policy which has been em emerged over the last year. And the government recently set out its heat and building strategy. And it introduced this idea of a heat pump where you rip out a gas boiler, you replace it with something that costs £10,000 or more because you have to introduce all these insulation measures as well, introduce uh, large water storage tanks that many people don't have space for. And then after all this investment, you're potentially left with uh, higher energy bills than you had before. So people are totally bemused by this. They're asking, where did this come from? It's not coming from listening to ordinary people. Uh, and once they're given a say, they may well say, well, we reject uh, these policies entirely. So I think a referendum is, is a very exciting idea. The the Elites and the establishment are terrified of ordinary people ha having a say on this because they think they know best. That's why they're here in Glasgow. They think that they can decide the minutiae of people's lives, how they heat their homes, what energy technologies they use. Um, and so this 
idea of a referendum is very threatening. And, and the Brexit result was really uh, the British people saying we, we had had enough of being told what to do. And as much as it was about the individual political issues, it was about people rebelling against what they saw as an establishment which didn't get them and didn't even want to listen to them. And you look at COP and you see they don't want to listen to skeptical voices. They don't want serious questions being asked. This is not a forum of debate that we're seeing in COP. It's a forum of backslapping of politicians who are there to improve, to big up their own egos, to big up their own sort of personal sense of achievement. Um, but where is the debate? Where is the questioning? And hopefully uh, that may come from a referendum. Yeah, I mean, do you think the referendum would, would go the way Brexit did, be a big surprise? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm from the United States. I landed in London. Every Almost every billboard, digital billboard, was, was about COP and was about saving the planet and all the basically alarmist propaganda. You get into Glasgow, it's that times 10, every single thing, and there's billboards everywhere um, about this. And so as an American coming to the United Kingdom, I would think, or you would think, that this entire country is behind is behind this idea is behind the the cop agenda the united nations agenda on this is it, would american be wrong to think that well it's very hard to speculate exactly how a referendum uh, would turn out and i don't think we're actually anywhere close to a referendum actually happening the the establishment was so shocked and upset by brexit so the idea that they'd allow another referendum unfortunately, seems a bit pie in the sky to me because they just wouldn't want to risk that happening again. But having said that, I think one thing that we do get from opinion polling on this topic is something like 70% of the British people, or even higher, think that the government should go further on climate change, which is a striking number. But then at the same time, a large percentage of people also don't want to spend anything on climate change. They certainly don't want their energy bills to go up or uh, otherwise they're only willing to spend a tiny amount of money. So there is that contradiction between the gov or between people saying they want the government to go further on climate change but they also don't want to spend uh, any money on it. And when they see the kind of policies like heat pumps, uh, like being forced to have electric vehicles that are in the pipeline, those contrasting desires of wanting to do more on climate change, but also not wanting to spend any extra money. And actually, ultimately, it's those economic considerations that I think will be strongest in people's minds. And if they end up getting poorer from net zero policies, I think that will be eventually a much more powerful uh, sort of impetus on, on public opinion. But w wouldn't you say that the steps that the, that, that the United Kingdom have kingdom has taken on climate has increased costs for people, maybe at a, at a such a gradual rate that they don't realize it. You know, in other words, it's a kind of a hidden tax on their lives already based on, you know, you can see you can see that, you know, the electric cars, you can see all these all these green efforts and and all of that stuff. I, is it is it the case that that Britons have um, basically been slow boiled on this for a few uh, years, a decade? It has almost been a form of hidden taxation that's been rising and rising. The most prominent climate change policy that we've had so far has been the subsidy of renewables, so wind and solar, in our electricity generation mix. Now that's happened from subsidies from people's energy bills. So it's, it's a small levy at first, but that's rising and rising, and, and it's being levied on the energy bills themselves. So many people think that that's the companies the energy companies who are imposing these costs when actually it's the government. The government is imposing these costs on people. And they've risen to about £10 billion a year uh, now that people are facing in terms of bills through, uh, through their energy bills that they're paying for wind and solar to subsidise them. But a lot of those costs also are going through business bills. So they're feeding through to higher prices in the shops. So they're not necessarily making that connection between government climate policy and the increased prices that they're seeing in the shops. But this inflation that we've been seeing recently, I think uh, that when people's uh, household budgets are stretched, that will really 
focus minds and will encourage politicians, hopefully, to look for areas where they can save money. Um, and that, that should be a countervailing factor uh, in this and will, will limit, limit the grand climate change plans of, uh, of uh, politicians. And certainly Rishi Sunak, the chancellor, has been a voice for restraint within the government to say, actually, maybe we should go a bit slower and not commit to really expensive plans before they've been properly thought through. Yeah. Oh, well, there's a comment here that says, isn't it amusing that the richest people in the world have invested vast sums of money in renewables to extract vast sums of money out of governments? <laughs> you know, so, you know, the old fossil fuel investment, you're actually investing in extracting actual energy yeah, out of the yeah. earth, whereas now is like the whole renewables scam, if you want to call it that, is is mm. a is a way to get money out of government. It doesn't really do anything to improve the the electrical grid or to make certainly doesn't make energy any more affordable, but it does make these wealthy investors wealthier. Yeah, well these the tragic thing about a lot of these climate policies is they haven't actually even done that much to reduce emissions. Even if you were really desperate to reduce emissions as quickly as possible, uh, what you would see is that investment in renewables has created such a, a intermittency uh, within uh, the grid. That means that you have to back it up with either coal or natural gas. Um, whereas low cut, well, nuclear power actually provides that replacement of, of fossil fuel power stations. Um, and so that sort of focus on wind and solar has probably slowed the transition to a more low carbon energy system um, at the same time as costing an awful lot for ordinary bill payers. Mm -hmm. Um, did you see the, uh, well, somebody comments here, the BBC drama, The Trick, was nothing more than alarmist lies that whitewashed the climate gate scandal. Uh, the British universities were lying about the climate. Did you watch yeah, Well, that? my colleague Andrew Montford was very involved in the uh, whole climate gate issue at the time and, and examined those emails and exposed some of what was going on in the climate science community and, and raised many legitimate questions. And what we saw with this documentary, unfortunately, was a completely one-sided uh, retelling of the story, um, which, albeit a compelling personal story and uh, someone who maybe uh, sort of received quite a sort of uh, challenging uh, personal change of circumstances from uh, this scandal, was nevertheless a legitimate form of uh, questioning of, of some of these things that were happening at the University of East Anglia in particular. So we didn't get a nuanced take on that story. Um, what we did, uh, did get was exactly as the commenter describes, complete uh, one-sided whitewashing of the story, which I think misses out so many of the important uh, details. Uh, somebody asks, how come the royal family is getting involved in politics because climate alarmism is political? Mm. Well, exactly. And uh, I would normally consider myself a supporter of the royal family. I'm a big fan, generally speaking. But for an unelected monarch now to be flying around the world many times, racking up huge uh, carbon footprints, um, and at the same time uh, lecturing us all about how we should reduce our emissions, um, it speaks of a, just a rank hypocrisy. And actually, Normally, the royal family haven't got involved in political issues, and yet they're treating the climate issue as if it isn't political. Perhaps they think there's just so much of a consensus that this isn't a matter of controversy yet anymore. But this, of course, is massively political, and it's going to have massive implications for ordinary people uh, in their daily lives. So they're sort of playing with fire. They're taking big risks, and I think the royal family needs to step back from engaging with the climate issue. Well, I mean, imposing these energy restrictions and these climate policies is by definition political. That's how you Absolutely. get these things implemented is through a political process. This COP26 is a gathering of politicians and it's a political meeting. It's not a scientific meeting. So mm. you're absolutely right on that. All right, we'll just have um, one more question here, or I guess uh, maybe a comment. Um, the moment that the lights go out due to power cuts, that is when the British public will vote to get rid of alarmist politicians like Boris. And um, I, I was attracted to that comment because, <coughs> because I think the same thing in the United States. I mean, mm. we had rolling blackouts and brownouts in California. Of course, there was the Texas 
uh, wind power disaster in the middle of winter that left a lot of people really vulnerable um, during the coldest part of the year in Texas. It's not always sunny in Texas. They, they do have winter down there. Mm. Um, and it still didn't seem to move the needle too much on people basically mm. revolting against these, you know, renewable, unreliable renewable mandates that you have mm. to have a certain amount of energy created by renewables. You know, it's all a, it's all a scam to prop up the industry, of course. Mm. And so, you know, is Britain going to have that um, that type of thing? Do, do, do you believe? Yeah. Is there is there a wake up moment that you see coming? Is it inevitable if they continue moving down this unreliable green road? I, it seems mm. to me that it is inevitable that there will be a slap across the face moment. Yeah. And it, it's not maybe that would be through a blackout or some sort of other uh, kind of event. Certainly the high prices that we've been seeing have the potential to be that wake up moment when people just can't afford their energy bills anymore. But there is there is an increasing risk of blackouts. What the government does at the moment is just spend a lot of money on backup technology. So we have lots of diesel generators that are on standby. We have a couple of coal power stations that we can fire up in extremis if the margins get really tight. But these backup measures um, may prove uh, insufficient. Uh, and that would be a really striking moment. It's uh, very hard to predict whether that will actually happen because we're investing so much in backup measures. But all of those backup measures are essentially a, an implicit subsidy for renewables because uh, the government likes to tell this uh, untruth that the costs of uh, sort of wind and solar are now so low that they, they're cheaper than fossil fuels. But actually, when you consider all the extra costs from backing this up um, and managing that intermittency and all the extra cables and uh, infrastructure that you have to build to manage all of this extra wind and solar capacity, you actually see that the prices are, are, are way beyond uh, what, what you pay with fossil fuels. And just one last thing, I, and I almost don't want to ask it because you shouldn't ask a question you don't know the answer to. I saw on Twitter today, I didn't actually get a, get a chance to watch the clip, but apparently a report, an environmental reporter for the BBC confronted Boris uh, on his climate policies. And Boris said something like, well, we can't completely abandon coal. Um, and I'm not going, we're not going to do that. And I think John Kerry even said, um, and then, and then um, that's right, Joe Biden um, is actually asking the American energy industry to increase its use and extraction and, and distribution of fossil fuels, uh, especially with the winter coming up. And John Kerry said, well, if Joe Biden said that he wants them to ramp it up for the next five years, I'd have been upset. But he just said he just wants them to do it right now. Uh, so those kind of comments seem to me that, uh, seems to tell me that no matter what these world leaders say at a place like Glasgow at COP26, somewhere in the back of their minds, they know that there is a reality of energy need and there is a reality of what can produce and give people that energy need and it is not renewables. Um, yeah, the, is, that, is that too optimistic to think that way or what do you make of those two comments by Biden and, and Boris Johnson? Well, Boris was, was being interviewed by a BBC correspondent about a potential coal mine uh, that would have provided many jobs for people in Cumbria in an area where they need skilled jobs. Um, and unfortunately, here you have someone who's paid for, as a public broadcaster, he's paid by all of anyone who wants to watch TV in Britain has to pay the license fee. So that's most of the public are funding his salary, and yet he's campaigning to take away their jobs. This is absolutely extraordinary. Um, that he's allowed, and, and the BBC have always claimed to be impartial. They're, they're not claiming to be on one side or the other. But how can this be seen as impartial broadcasting? So for a start, it, it's completely outrageous, that line of questioning in the first place. But also it reflects that actually we don't have alternatives to fossil fuels. Uh, there's no way of making steel affordably now um, without using coal. And so we can either have that coal mine it here in the UK, probably have lower emissions, or we can import it from elsewhere. Um, and we definitely don't want to do that if we can have those jobs here in the UK. Um, so yes, we, we will still need that coal and we still have coal power stations that are on standby to provide that energy when we need it. So our, our energy system is still overwhelmingly dominated by fossil fuels when you look at it in the main. Um, looking beyond just electricity and to the other types of uh, energy that people use. And uh, so there's still a huge way to go 
uh, in terms of decarbonizing the UK's energy system.